Hello and welcome back to All You Can Board. We're here with Own It, Play It, Skip It today. My first one mm -hmm. of the decade. Ever. No, ever, and, yeah. And it's also our 10th uh, episode of oh, Own It, Play It, Skip It. Oh, wow. So 10th anniversary and we booted Carlo up for the 10th <laughs> one. <laughs> Get out of here. You've been, we don't like it. We don't like him. Yeah, no, 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 he, he's, he's okay. We like him, yeah. <laughs> yeah he, he's fine. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this is great. Yeah, so if you haven't watched Own It, Play It, Skip It before, we do six games. Uh, we each have three. And we're going to basically rate them as Own It, Play It, or Skip It. Uh, and that's kind of our ranking. So I can say a game is a play. I'm going to explain to you why it is a play for me. It's possible that when you play it yourself, you might love the game and it's owned for you, but in case you line up with our you know, our perspectives or mm -hmm. our opinions or whatever, you might uh, have a decision here, uh, or be able to make a decision based on you know what we give here. But otherwise, it's just our opinions. So Braden's brought three games with him. Uh, I, actually, one of Braden's games we don't have a physical copy here of. I have three games here, and we're going to give uh, an owner play that's given for you. Yeah, let's do you it. you want to start, do you want me to start? I go for it. I'm going to start. You. Okay. So the first game I'm going to look at is a game called Fun Facts. So Fun Facts is a party s game. It's made by our, or sorry, uh, pro produced by Repos Productions, uh, which is the same company that does Just One. Um, and I got it mainly because, uh, I, well, I think it was Carlo that actually tipped me off to it, but because of how much I enjoyed Just One and mm. because of how much, like, those type of party games just hit the table so often and I, and like you have so many scenarios and situations that you can bring them out in. I thought, hey, it would be really good to have another game in my collection that, you know, if I have anywhere between the four and the eight count here and people don't play a lot of board games or they just want something super light, that I can give them fast or bring fast facts to the table and it'll, it'll uh, you know, land. So I played fast facts the first time was seven and the second time was seven. And I would absolutely say that I... So I'll, I'll, I'll lay it out as a play it first. I'll just say it. It is a play it. It's just missing an own it for me because I don't know that I would ever actually want to play it at the four player count. Mm. And, and I shouldn't say don't want to play it. I would play it at the four player count. But the 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 way it works is you have these these uh, you know little plastic arrows that you're writing your name on one side. And on the other side, you're going to write a number between, or on some of them, it's going to be between zero and 100. Other ones, it's just going to be, you know, any number based on what the question is. So the question could be something like, uh, how many tattoos do you have? And everyone at the table, this is a, this is a more straightforward one that we've gotten in one of ours, but everyone is going to write on their uh, thing how many tattoos they have, put them face down, and then go in a clockwise order from the starting player. You're going to place your arrow in the center of the table. The next person has to put their arrow beneath or above Above that arrow based on in this case how many tattoos they think they have in comparison to that person but when you get then to the last person if you're playing with eight they have to look at seven other arrows on the table and say where does my arrow position i can put it in the middle i can put it underneath this arrow so a lot of this is based on like what you know about the people that you're playing the game with right. around the table right with four, there's a lot less maneuvering that you're doing because when you if, even if you're the last person there's only three arrows on the table there's a better chance that even if you don't know, you can kind of guess into the right answer. Yeah. And it's a little bit less fun. Whereas with seven, you have to really start to think about the people at the table and what you know about them and, you know, where you think you rank. And, and the tattoo one is a really, like, uh, straightforward example. There's other ones where it's like, on a scale of zero to 100, how uh, likely are you to hold on to things you no longer need at home? Which is like, zero to 100 is a super mm. large scale, and that's something that you is very specific to each person. So you have to really start thinking at the table, like, Ooh, how how much of a hoarder is Brayden? Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> and that that is where the game gets really really fun and interesting, especially if you know the people at the table. So the reason it's a play is that I really really enjoyed this game. And the last time I played it with coworkers, it was a big big hit. And I and they kind of that's when I felt like it achieved what I wanted it to from my purchase. Yeah. But I would say that because I think the lower player counts aren't quite as interesting, and because it is really group dependent. There could be situations where I could have people over that, you know, a friend of yours is coming or a friend of Carlos is coming that I haven't met. And suddenly that it becomes a less attractive option to play just because it's going to be way harder for me to be like, yeah, I don't know this person. How do I know if they're how much of a hoarder they are, yeah. how many tattoos they have, things like that. Still interesting to w way to learn about people, but not, you know, as engaging maybe if you're trying to like hit the high scores and, and just see how well your group knows each other or whatever. So yeah, play it for me, but it is a really, really fun game. Uh, I, again, I just think you want to hit the higher player counts and you want to play with people that you that you know. Yeah, this looks like a super interesting game, one that would be right up my alley. Yeah. I mean, I think I've had at least two Repost Production games in my top 10. <laughs> Check right. that out if you haven't already. <laughs> uh, shameless plug. But yeah. I think 
Yeah, I think you're right. This seems like, again, very similar to just one where the more people you have, yeah. the more like cause for chaos you have and Absolutely. like readiness for like, you know, shenanigans to happen. You're yeah. shuffling it. One person's going, Oh my god, like I have like a hundred, like I'm such a hoarder. Like you think you're more than me? Yeah. Like And that's what happens is like after you're revealing, you have a lot of conversation that isn't even really part of the game. Yeah. But you have people being like what, you think you're that much of a hoarder? There's no way you're more a hoarder than me or whatever. Like, things like that. Or, like, there was one where how many countries have you... Or what's the longest you've you've stayed on a single vacation before? And so oh. we, we were basing that off of, like, what we knew of people. But then there was tons of reveals where we're like, what, you spent nine weeks somewhere? Are you sure that... Like, were you, was that a vacation? Were you living there? Right. Like, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, so it's it, there, it, it really is fun, not just for the game itself, but just sort of the aftermath. And again, it's one of those games where, like, there's a point system, we used it. This one is a little bit easier to kind of for me to to play into because it's a cooperative game. Like you're just trying to hit high scores and you you fall into different like ranges and they'll say you've achieved you're awesome or yeah. try better next time or whatever. Um, so the point system's already loose, but you could honestly just put this game on, not even track points, and just be like, we're going to play until we're bored and we just think that the questions are fun. It's an icebreaker, whatever. So lots of range with this game in the same way that like Just One has it. I, I wouldn't say it hits the levels of Just One or anything, but I think if you're looking for other party games to kind of flesh out your collection and be able to like play at, I would say, six, seven, and eight specifically, Fun Facts is a pretty pretty solid choice. Yeah, this one would be... I, I really want to play this one, I think. Yeah. Because oh, yeah, we will. Especially with people who like you're familiar with. Mm -hmm. bringing this out like we're so clover i think fits well if you don't really know the people yeah. too too well yeah. you can kind of be creative in that way this may be like you've played just one you've played so clover with them a few times yeah, yeah. you want to bring up the new party game that comes out yeah and spice again, things up change yeah. it up yeah i would say yeah and i would last thing i would say is that i think still think so clover and just one are better yeah I games can. but i will say that there is a lot to love here i would i would you know don't sleep on it give it a chance yeah fun facts fun facts cool uh, my first game for Own It, Play It, Skip It today will be the 2005 release of Wits and Wagers. And can I just say that when you told me it was 2005 this came out, <laughs> I was stunned. I can't believe that this is a 2005 game. I, I, I honestly thought it was like like between 2010 and 2020 for sure. And I thought like 2015, like right in the middle. That's it's wild. It's ridiculous. And I'm pretty sure my parents had a copy of this, like sitting on top of their basement fridge. I distinctly oh, wow. remember the yellow box. <laughs> there yeah and i must have played this as a kid but um awesome. yeah i've played this since this is prop so wits and wagers a quick summary is basically a trivia game where you don't necessarily need to know the answers super accessible you're everyone's writing down their own answer to the question and then arranging it onto a betting sheet and then you will bet on which answer you think is the closest price is right for rules not going over so close without going over then you get a certain payout based on where it is on the map Okay, and this is this is so great because yeah. again you have the banter of like you do you really know this or like yeah. I, I play this with uh, my parents and my dad. There was like one specific question from the old time, and he's like, "Oh yeah, like I I know this hundred <laughs> uh, percent." Oh, it was when when did Sesame Street uh, air? Oh wow, uh, okay, and it, it, it was in like sixty eight or whatever, or yeah. like or seventy two or something like this. And he was like, "Yeah, I was." Uh, you know, a teenager or something like this, and like you specifically <laughs> recalled like when Sesame yeah. went to <laughs> when it was, it was just so hilarious, <laughs> uh, so which was super great. And yeah. so everyone was obviously betting on his, um, which it turned out to be correct, right? But yeah. you could bluff in certain ways, like oh, you know this, and then yeah. bet on other ways. Mm -hmm. um, super accessible. I really love how, and so I should say, this is an own for me, an easy own, an easy own, super. Super accessible, can get to the table. You don't have to be super good at trivia. Even it, it actually makes it better if you're bad at trivia, mm -hmm. because like you'll throw it like a long shot, and then you'll maybe you'll get it right. Yeah, um, makes it really really nice. Um, I love the the little addition of some of the um, poker chips that they have into there. Oh, they yeah. have actual clay ones mm -hmm. for what you're betting. Yep. Um, yeah, super, makes it super accessible, easy to get to the table. Um, I think it plays up to ten. Oh, four. Wow. No, four plus. So you can play on teams if you yeah, wanted yeah. to, too. Right, I was going to say. Cause yeah. like, and there's some games that, that you know, like especially in the party genre, where like it, it'll say, I think So Clover is when we talked about, where it'll say, like, you know, it plays up to six. But it's, if you want to team off and you want to be like, hey, we're going to do three to team and kind of work together on figure, figuring out clues, it's kind of endless how many people you can yeah. play with then. And, and the good thing with party games in general is you can kind of, you know, 
almost mold the rules to whatever fits your group and and you know what you're trying to accomplish and how many people are there and everything like that. So, yeah, yeah, super quick playing, uh, an easy own uh, yeah. for Wits and Wagers for me. I've only ever played Wits and Wagers once ever, and oh. and it was a while ago. And so that's the thing is like I remember the gist of it and and it was it like, twenty years ago. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> when, when it, it came out, it wasn't twenty years ago. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when two thousand five when it first came out. Uh, no, it was like I, I it wasn't it wasn't. Well, it wasn't it wasn't your copy, was it? I played with you. I don't think so. No, no. I, it was someone else's copy. I played it for the first time, and it was one of those oversights in my like board game knowledge where people would bring it up and they say it's this classic party game, and I just had never played it. And I really did see the appeal of it, but I would have to play it like a bunch more yeah. to see where it ranks with other party games for me, just because I have so many solid ones in my collection already, or, or ones that like I play with with other groups. So yeah, I would love to play this more. This is another one if we're gonna ever like you know have a gaming night where we're playing games like Fun Facts and those type of like you know more. Uh, party-ish style games even, uh, bring wits and wagers because I, yeah. would, I would definitely like to just explore it more. Sweet. Yeah. Nice. That's an own for me, wits and wagers. An own. Okay. So uh, we have a brand new game-ish uh, from Reiner Knizia, which is always an exciting Who's moment that? Is he channel. like a beginning designer? Yeah. He, he, he... He's just designed a couple games and mm. they're really thinking he's going to break out sometime yeah. soon. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh... Uh, Longboard. So don't let the little small box fool you. Longboard is a really, really solid game. So uh, at, I think almost at the exact same time, there's two games announced or like I heard about at the same time, and that was San Francisco and Longboard. Mm. And when they, they're both Rainer Canizia games, and when they were announced, I was much more excited uh, at the time for San Francisco than I was Longboard. I wanted both, but Longboard just being about building your, your surfing boards compared to like the, you know, very colorful theme of San Francisco on, on the other one, I just, I, I kind of slept on this one a little bit. So. Having played them now uh, both, I have to play San Francisco more to be able to like do a review of it either on this channel or, so, or on this uh, series or something. But having played Longboard enough, I like Longboard way better than San oh, Francisco. Okay. So Longboard is an own it for me. And the way the Longboard works is you basically are designing a bunch of different colors of surfboards. The way you do this is when you take cards from the uh, available market or on the top of the deck, um, you are gonna add them to your, I think it's just called a supply. In your supply, they are not scoring you points, they're not actually like a part of one of your, your surfboards yet. The way that you actually bring it into your surfboard is using a different action instead of taking cards, you're moving them from your supply down onto your surfboard. Now, where it gets interesting is that everybody's supply is open to be stolen from by other players. Interesting. So, as an action on my turn, I can instead take one of my cards in my supply that is higher value than one of yours, and I can switch them. So this one now goes into your supply. I get the one from your supply, but I immediately play it as well, so now no one else can claim it and steal mm. it back from me. So you're you're having to like draw cards. You might be like, oh, I'm, I've drawn to the perfect card. But yes, you've drawn into it, but you, it's not yours yet, and someone else could now steal it from you. So a lot of what you're doing is looking at your own area, but there's tons of great player interaction because you're looking at everyone else's and saying, you know, what can I grab and what am I willing to give them in exchange? Like I, I played at two players where uh, they flipped over a card that I'm like, oh, I want that for sure, but I'm looking at what's available in my supply, which is pretty small at the time, going, everything here that I give them, I either can't give them because it's, it's the wrong value, or I'm gonna give them something as well that mm. is also great. Is that trade-off worth it? Am I gonna, you know, is the, is the ratio of points I'm gonna get compared to them from this worth it? So The, the, uh, the classic Lost Cities dilemma. Yes, exactly, right? yeah. The, it, it, I think I said this to you before I started filming, but it, it just, it, without being able to really quantify this or like explain it, it just feels like a Reiner Knizia game when you're playing it. Like, it's very simple rules. It plays in like you know less than half an hour or half an hour after after you play like learn the rules and everything. You're easily gonna be able to get especially a two player game done in under half an hour. And it's just your turns are flying by. You're either just flipping cards into your supply, you're stealing them, you're playing them to your 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 area. The the game ends I think when it's when four different surfboards. Um, have been built up to a certain height, and one of them is up to an even higher height. So, like at some point, that end game is going to be triggered. You have to be aware of who's getting close to triggering the end game as well. There's uh, scoring objectives that are like achievements, I think they're called at the end of the game. So it could be have the highest green surfboard, or okay. you have, a, have use no wilds, or, or something like that. So, and do those change from game to yeah, game? Yeah, there's too? there's a whole variety, and every game is going to think okay. going to have. 
three of them out or four of them out or something like that. Um, and every surfboard has stickers and the stickers is how many points you get. So even just, you just having a surfboard that's you know eight high, it's only getting you as many points as there are stickers on the boards. Oh. And wilds have no stickers. So if you use too many wilds, you don't, they're not worth many points, right? So the trade-off, it, it, it's, it's such a simple playing game. It it's, has so much depth to it and it played well um, at two, especially, which is where I was the most concerned about it just because, I shouldn't say, say, uh, even say concerned, but just the fact that you're going into like other people's supplies, that's more interesting when you have multiple supplies yeah. and there's multiple people stealing and you're like, I'm gonna steal that, but someone else steals it before you get to it and things like that, right? That is amazing, but at two, it is this tight, you know, mean, mean-ish type of experience where as soon as someone flips something you want, you're just in your head, you know, like, I'm taking that and someone else is gonna be like, oh my God, it, do I play this now because I know they're going to take it and they need the red four and I'm going to need it. Do they, do they need it before me? Are they going to steal it on their yeah. turn? Like, I don't know. It's just a really, really solid game. Uh, really impressed. Again, I think I went into it with my expectations being, I'm going to enjoy this because it's a Kanitsia game, but I don't think it's going to be like a one that hits super hard for me. And I was completely wrong. This is one of my favorite games that I played in the last little bit. Uh, Longboard, Reiner Kanitsia, and Own It, and you should definitely check it out. Wow, yeah. This is Mm -hmm. a game that definitely went under my radar for sure. I think maybe, I can't remember, maybe you covered it in one of the games you were anticipating. I think I did. I think I think it was this and San Francisco were covered both yeah. in the same video. Yeah, yeah and I was like, oh, this is this is interesting, I think. Yeah. Um, but hearing you rave about it now, too, is is really, really cool. And yeah. where, you know, there draw some similarities to Lost Cities, but I think you're right. Like, the higher player count plays up to four, it says yeah. here. Like, yeah. that dynamic of, like, stealing from other people's supply, but then yeah. you trying to plan for it makes it, like... Yeah. Is it that little like that? No, 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 no. Exactly. Right? It's, it's juicy. Num, 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 like num, it's num, got num, that <laughs> like that extra bitiness to it, where yeah. you can try to plan as much as you can. Yeah. But if someone takes that from you, now you've got to pivot, and that yes. is like exhilarating in a in a great but also frustrating yeah. way. It's it, it is like yeah. I think I think four. I don't want to say four is going to be the best player count because there is that trade off of like the game is going to be a little bit longer. I don't think it'll be very much longer in this one. But compared to like when you're comparing your three and, and two, but I, I think that like the the th- for sure three players might like is going to be a solid experience because you have now two people you're trading between and there is that other person who can steal cards before you. Yeah. Four, you're just upping the chaos a little bit and you're upping. Uh, yeah, it, I think the laughs around the table as well. So I, I don't know. I think I think it's honestly a game that's going to be solid across all the player counts and just is going to be uh, a go to for me uh, as like a quick under half an hour game where I want player interaction and where I want there to be like good strategy and thinky. The thinkiness that I normally get from a game like Lost Cities but can't play with more than two. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Which is kind of where Enchanted Plumes fit in for me too it, where, with it being able to play up to six. I feel like Longboard, there's a lot of these games coming out that like even if they, this one doesn't have tons of similarities, well I guess it has some similarities to Lost Cities but it, it doesn't have the hand management's more like your your open supply yeah. management but those they kind of fit in this one genre and, and the more those games are accessible at higher player counts than two the more i can get them to the table so yeah, yeah big win for me reiner knizzi is, is a uh, genius when it comes to like tough yeah. decisions oh, and like con- inner conflict with yourself so <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm super excited to, and, and, to try this one and hating the game you're playing in the best way <laughs> yes. where you actually love the game yes you're playing. <laughs> oh my god love but it that is longboard and it's an own it all right, next up for me is the quick playing 15 minutes, roughly maybe 20 at the top, Turing Machine here uh, from Scorpion Mask mm-hmm. uh, Games, who is a Quebec publisher, I believe. They're oh, Canadian. I didn't even know that. Yes. Nice. Um, uh, local Canadian, which is yeah. great. Um, so Turing Machine is a deduction game, if you don't know, um, where you are putting together, uh, you basically have a punch card system that acts as like an analog computer. There's been a lot of coverage on it, uh, but y- this is very much akin to something like uh, Wordle or uh, Sudoku, where you can, or a logic puzzle of some mm-hmm. sort, right? Where you are using these punch cards and these different, and testing against these different modifiers to see, or logic gates to see whether or not your certain three co- a number code is good or fits within these parameters. Yeah. So the goal is to s- solve this code, figure out what those three numbers are, and you're trying to do it in the least amount of questions and tests possible. Yeah. Um, so this for me, 
Um, I had I was super hyped. The production is fantastic. Yeah. I mean, unbelievable. Definitely one of the main draws for it too. Yeah. And just the design and the concept, I think, is phenomenal. Um, this was actually a game that I was trying to think of in my head and design. Like I was just trying to think of different designs. I was yeah, like, what yeah. if you created some sort of like? Um, I really wanted to create like a. Uh, what is the game where you're trying to solve someone else's code? I can't think of it right now. But you have like the the different colors. Board game. Yeah. Trying to solve oh someone no else's code. no don't. Do... It's like. Have I played it? Uh, maybe it's not called Code Breaker. Someone in the comments. Oh, Get in the oh, comments oh, if I, you know what it is. Yeah, and now, now that you, but now, yeah, is it called Code Breaker. I don't think so. No. no. Okay. No, now that you said that, though, I think I know what you're like, talking about. It's not from genius. It's it, there's. It's yeah, like yeah. a one word thing. Okay. Someone knows what it is. Yeah. They're they're, they're, <laughs> they're gonna, gonna, gonna comment, comment with it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is this is very much like this. But you're not playing against anyone. Right. You're um, well. You can. Yeah. It's basically who can solve it the fastest. But you can play the solo, and that's primarily what I've played it at. Yeah. Um, so for me, I was super excited about this. I love uh, love doing wordles, love doing puzzles like this. Um, I think the downside for this for me was, I mean, it seemed to go very quickly for me, which is great. It's quick playing. Yeah. Um, but th for me, it's, it's going to be a play to see if you like it. If you like games like this, if you like games that are, you know, you can solve from one step to another and kind of think and deduce and look at puzzles, um, it's really, really good for in terms of that, yeah. I like I like this almost primarily as a solo game. Yeah. Mainly because I like to sit there and think about it for a while. I'll I'll right. take a look and I'll concentrate. I'll think this and then this, you know. And if I'm playing with my wife, she might tell me, "Okay, like we've been sitting here for five <laughs> minutes," and <laughs> right. I'm like, "Yeah, but I need to think about because there's this parameter." Then like, I got to count for how many threes. So am I going to ask for it? And can I double up right. on different parameters that I'm testing for? What's the best question to ask at this point? Yeah. Um, so I think it, I think it's a play for me, not necessarily an own because I, it, it does take a little bit of time to set up um, with everything. But again, yeah. the production is great. I think it's definitely worth a try to see if you like this. This could be a really good. They have daily puzzles they put out online, yeah, which is really cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I know you played some of this too. I so did, I'm curious yeah. what, what your thoughts so, are. So yeah, you lent it to me, and I played it solo as well. Um, I, I think I echo most of your thoughts. Like the main thing for me is that. For something that is so quick plain and is is very much like supposed it feels like it's supposed to be like the wordle-esque thing you you know you play it whether it's daily or whether it's every couple days and you just kind of like you know you get better and better you're doing the harder and harder ones and you just have these daily challenges regular challenges you can be playing the problem with that is that you know wordle i can as it using this as an example again or even but even in sudoku or picross or any of these things that all have apps and ways to access on your phone or computer or whatever i can flip open my phone and I can play the word a lot and I can do that all in like sometimes under five minutes. Yep. Like it's just done. Turing Machine plays very quickly, but I have to set the entire thing up on the table. I don't want to make it seem like you're setting up Gloomhaven here, but like, <laughs> <laughs> like it's not like there's that much going on. Oh, but like there's enough to set up that you might consider for a second like, yeah, but I, I want to play it and I, and I have 20 minutes, so I really want to do this whole setup for yeah. this and then have to package it all up too. Like I think that that is enough of a consideration that it's a bit of a downside and then it being bet like I, I could see I could see playing this at two. I think I said this to you before when we were talking about like I could see a situation that like you know if you're you're living with a partner and you both like pu puzzle game or these type of like you know quick playing puzzle games, daily puzzle mm -hmm. type things, that either you could leave it set up or easily set it up and you, you, and compete daily for the daily challenge where you're bringing up the daily challenge on your phone. You guys are competing. You're keeping tallies on like who's winning more. I can see I can see the appeal of it. Mm -hmm. I just don't think that. It's going to be a, a board game that, like, I bring out in, like, I'm having people over for a board game night. No. And, and even if I'm playing party games, I just don't know that I'm going to be setting up Turing Machine to all do a bunch of puzzles, especially if we have more than two people. Yeah. So I feel like one or two are the, is the sweet spot, and, and probably one, I think we both agree, it's, it's, it's probably best as a solo game. It, it's, uh, um, again, outlier situations where it works that you have someone you can regularly mm -hmm. play with. Um, but for me, and, and uh, the, the, I want to bring this up, this up uh, as an example because I think it would be amazing if someone made this game. Um, but we were talking how I don't know if the, how many people have played the the video games, um, the Professor Layton video game series, oh, right. uh, which I think were on like the 
the DS and like the, the, the Nintendo line of handhel uh, handhelds, um, or uh, even more recent games like The Witness, um, it could be another example, where you essentially have like other things you're doing, but you're driven forward by small puzzles along the way. So like the, in one series there's a storyline and it's these little puzzles that kind of like, you know, uh, kind of link all the stories together. Whereas in The Witness you have this world you're exploring and puzzles are all kind of linking it together. I would have loved a game where if I'm playing it solo like this, it's not just like, oh, how many do I want to do and, and how quick can I beat them? There's actually something I'm accomplishing, even and it's all just linked together by these same simple puzzles, yeah. but there's this grander thing that maybe I'm accomplishing. Like, I think that would have been really, really cool and a reason that I would have like continually set this up on the table and come back to it. But just the daily puzzle things, I just think that it's competing with other things that are more accessible on my phone and things like that. Yeah. For as cool as the components and stuff are, like it is really cool to see this work and be able to compare and put the cards and be like, oh, that's a check or that's an X. Like it yeah. feels satisfying. You yeah. Say that. And I'll say like this would not work, I don't think, as an app, right? Because no. it would just like you would type in the code and then you would type in what modifier or yeah. whatever test you're testing against. And it would just give you a check. It wouldn't yeah. like you putting together the code yeah. and then Way testing it again. And like yeah. that is cool. Yeah. That is very, very cool. Um, yeah. Super, super good. And I do think I want to go quickly, just briefly touch on the, the player count thing too. Yeah. I could see at two players, right? Because you have hidden screens. So like you see one player testing something and then they go, oh, okay. And then you're right. going, what, 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 what do they do? Like, yeah, for did sure. they learn something? Like that, I could see yeah. that being like a tasty little, like, uh, yeah. It is tasty. <laughs> it is tasty. It is tasty. It is tasty. Um, I could see that being a nice point of contention and yeah. having some nice tension there. Yeah, I, um, I honestly think two player, like two players, I can see being a solid count, yeah. and I can see the appeal. It's it's more when you get to, like beyond that that I just. Like I just, me per personally, I just don't see having a board game night and with all the other games that uh, you know it's competing against, to be like for three or four, I'm going to bring a Turing machine, right? And, and, yeah, and that's a good point actually. I think this fills an interesting spot in yeah. board games, right? Where yeah. it doesn't, it's not necessarily a board game night game. It, yeah. it could be if you have the right group. It's you, a board game afternoon play, game. That's right. If you if you want, <laughs> like it's, it could be a daily thing. It fits yeah. into a puzzle. Yeah. Um, oh, I had one other point now. I can't remember it. Um, but it, it it fits this interesting spot, spot yeah. um, and, and I think, which I think is cool. And if you do have a situation where, or just a place in your home that you could leave it set up and mm. be doing it as a daily challenge, I think it's even way more attractive because then it eliminates the entire setup and you can quickly sit down, do a puzzle, walk away from it. You could have, like, again, if you're living with someone, you, you could be over your coffee in the morning, you, you compete over a cup, the daily challenge and a couple other ones and you go to work or whatever. Like, yeah. I can see how it could be really, really cool that way. It's just a little bit tougher if it's something you're going to constantly be Set, setting up, take, tearing down, setting up, tearing down, just to do a quick little puzzle that feels like, it, again, it's competing with things that you could do a lot easier. Yeah. Oh, and co-op was the other thing. You could, mm. like, if you want to play a two-player co-op, yes. like, like, great, yeah. fabulous. It can work. It can do it that way. Mm -hmm. Turing machine, a play to see if it's for you. Um, interesting, interesting, fantastic yeah. it is, uh, production. It, yeah, it's just very cool to see how it works with all the little codes and everything. I, I, yeah. I really like that aspect of it. Okay, last game I'm going to look at. Uh, is a game that was, I think when it first came out, and we we're, a little, I guess, a little bit late here to the party, but uh, was talked about a lot, um, and that is a game called Furnace. Oh, yeah. Uh, so Furnace uh, is a, it's, it's an engine building game that has really strong bidding elements is the best way to, to word it. Yeah. And so it's kind of divided into two phases. The way it's gonna work is you're gonna have all these cards that are available to bid on at the start, and you're gonna have a bunch of, uh, every player is going to have these circular discs. And the discs are gonna have different numbers on them. I think they range from one to four, and there's some other powers that can change, like someone could have doubles of a different number, number. but just at a base level, you're gonna have these one to four discs, and you're bidding on the cards that you want to bring back to your engine to be able to, uh, score you points essentially, then whoever has the most points wins. But the way that you bid is that if you you can lose the bid and it can still be beneficial to you. And in fact, there's gonna be tons of times where you want to lose a bid and that's because there's something called compensation. Compensation is if Braden bids a four for something and I bid a two, at the top of that card, there's gonna be resources listed or something listed at the top of the card that the losing bid gets as compensation. The winning bid doesn't get that, they get the card. So in some mm. situations, you might be going after a card that is great for your engine, and I might not want that card, but the resources that I would get as compensation would make sense, so I might just put a single one chip and just I'm willing to use that chip to gain those resources. This is by far my favorite part of the game. Like this is, this is what I really enjoy about Furnace, is this bidding and having to figure out, you know, 
how many what chips does Braden have left? Like he has the four left, which means he, he that, that is the highest number. If I play something, do I think I can win it with a two, or do I have to go all in with my yeah. four? Right? Like, am I okay if I lose it with gain the compensation, or is that going to be devastating that I lost it with my three or whatever? Right? So I think that that part of the game is by far the strongest. When you get to the actual engine part, you're taking taking the cards back and you're having to like use the abilities on all the cards to essentially generate resources. In, in different ways, you're generating resources that are then gonna generate points or convert into points. And it's, it's this big conversion part of the game. I will say that, that take, like you start the game with this interactive, like really heated, uh, uh, you know, play, yeah, player interactive part of the game. And then it sort of just turns into this thing where everyone's doing their own thing in front of them. And it says to do that part of the game simultaneously, which I would highly recommend, but it's, it becomes that everyone just kind of goes in front of them and starts you know, saying, okay, I'm gonna do this, convert to this. And when we have played it, we've said that out loud so that everyone knows that they're doing things correctly and we kind of are aware of what people are <laughs> yeah. doing. You can just do it silently and everyone's converting. I would just say you have to have a group that you trust that everyone like knows the rules of the game and yes. so that someone's not gonna make a mistake or generate a bunch of stuff every round that they shouldn't have been generating or something, right? So. If you can get through that part simultaneously and it goes quicker, it's it's a, a less of an issue. The variant that's in the box, I actually prefer. I think the variant is the the way to play it for me, which is you can't do your card conversions in any order you want. It has to go in a horizontal line from left to right. And so then when you're bringing cards back, you have to say, oh, where do I want to position this card? And it's locking that card into its position. And it becomes this uh, way more tricky thing to solve of like, yes, I have all these cards to work, but how do I put them in the right order to generate me the most resources? And in some cases, putting it here is going to get me this, but now it's going to hinder me in this way. Mm -hmm. That was a little bit more interesting. So all that to say, uh, Furnace is going to be a play it for me. Um, it would have been, it, it would have had a chance to be an own it. I just think that that second phase is missing a little bit of something. And I know it's the thing that it's missing uh, is something that holds this experience back way more for Carlo, for instance. Mm. Like I think I like Furnace a lot more than Carlo specifically because the second phase isn't as big of an issue to me as it is to, to Carlo. Wait, are you saying this is a two-phase game that yeah, I know that you don't like? I had, I had a two-phase <laughs> game that that didn't resonate in the same way for Carlo. Yeah, I know it's 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 wild, but uh, I still really like it. Like I I do really like Furnace. I think it plays really really quick. Um, that bidding phase. Um, because of how interactive and how fun it is, it makes up for me that the second phase isn't as as interesting. Um, and it still is interesting. It's just more that like it, it starts at this game where we're like we're laughing, we're 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 c competing, and we're saying like, oh, how could you take that from me? Like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get this compensation, mm -hmm. and you're figuring all this out, and then all of a sudden, it's just like everyone is doing their own thing. And you're like, okay, convert, 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 and it just kind of like. It, it's anticlimactic is the best yeah. way to, to describe it. So yeah, play it for me, but I would say that if you do like bidding games, if you like engine builders, and you're looking for something that is quick play, like this is four rounds that is done in under an hour for sure, and I could easily see this being something that you're getting done in like 45 minutes or less uh, once you have played a bunch of rounds of it, I would say that uh, it, it, it is something you should definitely check out, and I would just recommend not, we play with two, uh, Carlo and I, and it adds in a third like dummy-ish player. I don't know if they consider it a dummy player, but there's other discs that are being like the blocking you and, right. and things like that. Uh, but it's way better when you have all player care, uh, uh, player care, play players around the table instead of CPUs or whatever. Humans, uh, humans. They're called, you have humans. They're called humans. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so three and four would be my like desired counts yeah. for this game, but it wasn't bad at two. Yeah, this is interesting. I played it a couple times with you guys too, mm. and I'm gonna make a bold prediction here. Mm. Okay, bold prediction. Okay. Let's hear it. We're gonna see another game that has the bidding mechanics of Furnace yeah. by the end of the year of 2024. Wow. By the end of 2024? Yes. You're giving yourself two years, so that's not even that bold. <laughs> <laughs> bold, okay, but... bold would have been the end of this year. <laughs> well, but, like we're already like two months in. Like, Do you think someone's well, designed? Don't call kinda... it a bold prediction, man. <laughs> All right, fine. By the end of this year, someone's going to have copied or used or iterated on the okay, bidding like mechanics of either that or you have to come back to it. Either that or you have to say, I'm gonna make a lukewarm prediction here. <laughs> <laughs> Much like my coffee here that I <laughs> yeah. still have some. I, um, I hope so, I hope you're right. Yeah, because I think it's great. It's fantastic. Every, yeah. I think everyone knows, or a lot of people know at this point that the bidding mechanics are yeah. fantastic for um, Furnace. And I just, I completely echo everything that you said. Like it's yeah. the, um, the resource conversion and like talking it out, like I think is almost necessary in some cases, mm -hmm. just to make sure everything is going smoothly. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the bidding is like that little contentious points here and there, like yeah. 
fantastic, yeah. And I think just in general, I've also just come to realize that like when a game relies really heavily on resource conversion, it doesn't, it's not something I'm as interested in. Like when it's the entirety of like the the foundation of the game. And and I think I realized that when we played, uh, Carl and I played Lahav for the first time recently. And, I, and I, I, I'm not ready to make a vertical on Lahav. I liked it. But I by the end, I realized that so much of what I was doing was just how efficiently can I convert resources? And that's fun, but not like it has to be a short experience for me where because yeah. if, if I find that at the end of like two and a half hours that I'm just still converting resources as efficiently as I can, I just it doesn't it doesn't interest me as much, which is I think one of the reasons I love that furnace is this short playing game is in a short for time sure. frame like that, I like the resource conversion. How can I optimize yeah. and, and do this well? It just it's if it was like two and a half hours and two hours in you're like, I didn't optimize this well. It just it's a little bit deflating to me at that point. So yeah. But yeah, Furnace, I think, just hits that sweet spot in length uh, and interesting bidding. And then the resources kind of feeling of just like, it, it's not the main part of the game. It's the secondary part of the game. Yeah, so, for sure. Yeah. That is Furnace, and that is a play it. Cool. Uh, the last game of this video is one that I do not own, but one that is going to appear here. It's Living Forest. Mm -hmm. uh, Living Forest, I don't own. I've only played on BGA, but I have 11 plays of it. Nice. So. Uh, I played it a lot last year online with a lot of people in our Discord. If you're not a part of our Discord, you should be. Join up, <laughs> become a part of the board horde. Is that what we're calling it? Now? Yeah. You didn't see this in the Discord. I didn't. Oh, oh yeah, okay. we're calling the it the board horde. horde. Okay. TM or patent pending at this point. Okay. Yeah. Um, shout out to my hordies. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Was that in the Discord? <laughs> no, it absolutely you just made not. That <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, Living Forest. Um, Living Forest is a very interesting game. It won the Kenner Schmiel uh, Jars. Last year? I think so. Yeah, man, time is weird right now. Time is weird. Um, over, I think it was against Dune Imperium at the same time. I think that's right. Yeah, I that's, I, I'm, pre it, I'm pretty it, sure that's right. I, I could be, this they could were be involved blasphemy. in the same yeah. year or whatever. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so, um, and this is going to be a hot take. Well, maybe not a hot take now. Now you got me doubting. <laughs> so let's put like an, a, a, an alert warm. for lukewarm alert. Okay. <laughs> lukewarm take. Okay. This is a skip for me. Okay. Living Forest is going to be a skip for me. And yeah. so after playing it 11 times, I think what I found was, you know, I guess I should explain what Living Forest yeah. is for those who know. Quick, a very quickly. This is kind of like a, a deck building game where you are, uh, there are multiple winning objectives. Okay. So you can extinguish so many fires, or I think you have to do it. Uh, 12. You have to reach yeah. a 12 number, right? So whether that's extinguishing fires on the board, collecting an amount of trees, um, or getting a certain amount of um, flower right. icons, basically, yeah. as a part of it. So you're drawing cards, and uh, if you hit a certain amount of these black symbols, if you hit three symbols, then you have to stop drawing cards, right? Yeah. And each card will have certain symbols on them, so there'll be suns, which can allow you to buy more cards and certain things. You'll have water, which will allow you to extinguish fire from the middle and all this other stuff. Okay, yeah. So you want to collect and try and build up this engine where you're focusing towards one. Yeah. Where it didn't really connect with me was the point where I really wanted to try out different strategies. Right. And I felt like I was being forced a little bit into um, some other avenues. Like I wanted to try one where I focused on like movement on this like inner board, right? right? Yeah. And focusing on that to try and springboard into other things and it just didn't, and I mean, it, this is probably part of the game design where you have to really pay attention to what your opponents are doing and right. try to battle them or go different routes. Um, it just, it, it, it felt very deflating. Like I, right. I wanted, I really wanted to go somewhere and I thought I was doing well and then an, an opponent just absolutely demolishes me. Now, I will fully say that maybe there's something that I'm missing to this game. Right, but um, after 11 plays, 11, you, should, you should still, it shouldn't, you shouldn't be left with that kind of thing. Yeah, I feel like I'm wandering like blindly looking for like what what am I missing from this? Right. Um, and it, it just doesn't connect. Like the, the theme and everything is like, it's beautiful, yeah. beautiful art, great, it's just, it's, I don't think it's for me. Yeah, I've, I've only played this twice and they were spaced apart and I can't say that I was like fully versed on the, like I knew how to play, but I don't think I had like knew the optimal strategy either time I played. But I will say that the one feeling I was left with both times was at, when, they, when it ended was I just much rather be playing Mystic Veil. Vale. So Mystic oh, Vi Mystic Veil vale has, is, is not a similar game overall, but that mechanic of 
um, you flipping cards, and if you have too many of a certain icon, you yeah. bu- you bust like the pushing your luck right. aspect or whatever is a big big part of Mystic Veil. But your Mystic Veil is the one where you have it's a deck building game that always has twenty cards in your deck. Instead of adding cards, you're adding more things to the cards that yeah. you have, so they have like more sections on them. Mm-hmm. Mystic Veil, I don't even have my collection where I did call it. But I enjoy Mystic Veil vale a lot, and I would much rather play Mystic Veil vale than I would play Living Forest. Like I didn't think Living Forest was bad, but it just like, and I, I featured it in one of my new game videos as something I was really a- anticipating. But yeah, after playing both, I definitely was left with a bit of a disappointed feeling, and just that there was another game out there that did stuff better. Yeah, and I think maybe playing it on BGA, especially turn-based, doesn't yeah. like you do need to pay attention to what I think your opponents are sure. doing. Yeah. So it may help to obviously have it in front of you playing it real time, right? Yeah. So I will give that caveat to this for sure. skip review. Yeah. Uh, for me, for me, for yeah. sure. Definitely could be absolutely is for others. It's yeah. won an award. Yeah. So it's yeah. a good game. But there's for a me, lot of there's a lot of cool things it's doing. And I think that if if for instance I hadn't played games like Mystic Veil vale or uh, some other deck builders or or just games that did some of those mechanics, I could have seen playing this and being like blown away by it, especially if I was playing it in person and, and it a game, being a game that stayed in my collection, I was yeah. you know, showing to a lot of people. I think now just like knowing what I do about a bunch of different games, having a bunch of different uh, similar experience with games, I don't think it's doing anything to just set it apart. I don't know. If, I think I would have probably done it, given it a play, but I've played less than you. Yeah. And, it, and if I maintain the feeling I did throughout, I could see it be like, no, there's just not enough here for me to... Uh, you, you know, know I wanted to have that, like, lukewarm take, Yeah, of course. So <laughs> yeah, pro the skip. lukewarm take. Yeah, no, I, like, I don't know if I will want to play it yeah. again. Like, I feel yeah. like I'm done with it. After 11 plays, which I mean is a lot of plays, like yeah. I came back to it, but you can almost say that the living yeah. forest is dead. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks for tuning in. Yeah, yeah. those uh, are the six games. Yeah, that's it. Uh, let us know uh, in the comments what you think of our ratings, uh, how you would rate these six games, whether you agree with us, disagree with us, whether you think these are hot takes or lukewarm takes uh, that we <laughs> that we've been saying here. Uh, and uh, as always, if you wa- are not in our Discord, if you are not a uh, part of that community, and you want to join, the link is in the description. Yeah. you can find us there. L- leave a comment with how many tattoos you think Dylan and I both have. Oh, there you as go. Part of just one. Perfect. Or sorry, not just one. I, fun facts. <laughs> fun facts. Sorry, I feast the Odin, my favorite game. <laughs> <laughs> How many tattoos does Brayden have? How many tattoos do I have? And if you get them right, you won't win a prize, but you'll we'll just say you win. In the yeah, comments. you'll get a heart. You'll get a heart from us. <laughs> yeah, and a big smile. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.